Hi, my name is Matt Ozalis. I'm an RF engineer at Keysight Technologies. This video is the first one in a series of short videos on how to design a stable high frequency amplifier. The objectives for the entire video series are basically to unravel the complexity that's associated with stability in high frequency circuit design. You know, there's nothing worse than spending months designing an RF circuit and then putting it on the bench and seeing an output spectrum that looks something like this. You know, multiple tones where there should be only one tone. And until you fix this problem, you're really kind of stuck. You'll have no good results to show your manager. You can't prototype your system, and you're going to have a pretty stressful time as a design engineer. So stability problems are stressful, they're costly, they're time-consuming. And in this set of videos, I'm going to show you that in many cases, they're not that difficult to figure out up front in the design phase. And solving the problem uh, in the design phase is a heck of a lot better than trying to solve the problems later in the lab. So this video is a series. There'll be seven short presentations in total. This is part one, The Trouble with K-Factor and the Paradox of Choice. And in case you're wondering, yes, I thought of this title after watching Star Trek. Thanks for noticing. Um, anyway, if you took any RF microwave courses in college, you, you probably learned about Rollet's stability factor. And all you need to do for that is take the S parameters of your circuit, run them through some equations, and determine stability. It's nice and easy. And we all learned that if the K factor is greater than 1 and the magnitude of the determinant is less than 1, you're all good. But unfortunately, I have to break some bad news here. That's not true. And I can show this using a simple example which comes from the paper that I highlighted here. So now I'll go to ADS and show you. Uh, this is a ring oscillator. That's it's exactly the one shown in the paper. It has two controlled sources, and it's got a few lumped elements. It's really a pretty cut and dry design here. And for this, I'll run two types of analysis in the simulation. The first one is just simple k-factor from the input to the output. And the second's called normalized determinant function. We'll talk about that later in the video series. And if you look at the results, the k-factor looks really stable, but the determinant function shows an instability at about 1.5 gigahertz or so. And if you're not sure which one's correct, I'm going to spoil it for you. The normalized determinant function turns out to be the correct answer here. And that means that the k-factor is really not always a complete characterization of stability. Well, if you go back to the original work by Rollet, you can actually find an explanation for this. Uh, basically, the provision that I'm underlying here is saying that the k-factor is valid if the two-port network is stable with open and short circuit terminations applied at either port. In other words, if the unloaded network is stable to begin with, then you can predict the, the, I'm sorry, the stability of the loaded network um, by, by design for the decay factor. So it stems from the original intent that k factor was actually a measurement technique originally. So if you could measure the network, the computation was valid. Uh, these days, however, this assumption is awfully difficult to justify. So first, you can simulate anything, including an unstable circuit like I just showed, and it'll work just fine in the tools unless you actually try to build and measure it. And second, Circuits are a lot more integrated and complex today than they were in the 1960s, and that means that the points of access are often far removed from the exact location of the instability. So k-factor in simulation is not going to buy you much confidence these days. And one question you might ask, is it really that bad to solve stability problems on the test bench? You know, why bother going through all the effort up front in the design process anyway? And, you know, for many years, designers could actually go in the lab, they could fiddle with bypassing, and they could cut traces, they could add some loss and eventually stabilize their circuits. So I've certainly done that many times in my career. So the question becomes, you know, what's different today? And here's an answer that you can find actually inside one of our Keysight products. This is the UXR. This goes up to 33 gigahertz. Now, if you look at past generations of design, um, the chips inside of this were done using, you know, chip and wire, thin film shins, and, and interconnects. And while it might be hard to imagine, a good engineer or technician can actually get in here and access some of those connections and potentially fix stability problems in the lab. But on our latest generation product, we moved to wafer level packaging for several of the ICs. And even the best technicians in the world can't get into those interconnects because they're basically done in the wafer fab post-process. So there's no cutting traces or adding anything to this type of design anymore. The problems really need to be solved in the design process by good design practice. Now, this is maybe a too specific of an application, so let me take a step back and be more general here. Uh, if you look out across the wireless communications industry, whether you're working in commercial, cellular, or automotive, or aerospace and defense, I'm willing to bet that you're noticing two trends happening. Uh, first, the frequencies are increasing. That's a general statement, but it's true. For example, 
If you bought a car 10 years ago, chances are it didn't have a radar sensor on it at all. Well, today, most new cars have multiple radar systems built in. These components that hardly existed before are now, you know, ubiquitous in your car and they're operating mostly at millimeter wave frequencies. So to get gain at high frequencies, you need devices that have high FTs. And usually that means they have more gain at lower frequencies too. And as you'll learn in this video series, gain is a fundamental necessary component for instability. And higher gain means more chances for stability problems. The other thing that's happening across the industry is that systems are getting much more complicated. Look at commercial cellular as an example. For a 4G system, you'll probably only have one antenna and one transmit path for your signal. But now for 5G, we have phased array MIMO systems. Now instead of one transmit chain, you've got multiple chains. The system increases in complexity and scale by at least an order of magnitude here. So what does this mean for circuits that make up the system? Well, they've got to become more integrated too. And more integration means more coupling because functional blocks are packed together more tightly. Another word for coupling is feedback, which is the other necessary component for instability, as you'll see in this video series. So because of these trends, there's more gain and more feedback, and that makes stability problems compound. And you can't just solve them in the lab anymore. You have to figure out how to do that in the design itself. So I threw cold water on the K-factor analysis earlier. Maybe there's a better approach to characterize stability. And if you look through the literature, there are actually lots of approaches out there, so many that it actually becomes sort of a paradox of choice for design engineers. Each of these methods that I'm showing here takes some effort to set up, run, and analyze. And the question really becomes, which one should you use? Uh, we'll talk about that in the video series, but also I'm going to show an alternative, which is a new probe that lets you perform most of these analysis techniques with almost no additional effort. The probe is called the WS probe, and it was developed by a fellow named Tom Winslow. He is a distinguished fellow at Maycom, and he's also a user of Keysight's tools. And what I'm showing here is one single simulation using this probe that can give you results matching essentially 28 other individual simulations for various stability figures of merit each with their own test bench and setup. But that's, that's getting a little bit ahead. Before we get there, you'll need to understand some of the basics, which I'll cover in the second video. So that was the introduction. Thanks for watching. If you find this useful, uh, like the video and subscribe to our channel. And you can also download the workspace at the link below the video. See you next time.